have released eight titles, folks, eight titles, um, and a lot of more information. Kevin Jaggernaut, um, are we enthusiastic about a slimmed down version of TIFF? Uh, yeah, I think we're happy that TIFF is happening, um, but it is a big change. I mean, I think 2019, the lineup had just under 400 titles. And now we're looking at uh, the, the festival has announced they will, they will go on. Uh, they will have um, 50 films um, with physical screenings for the first five days of the festival and uh, virtual events for the whole, for the whole uh, thing. Um, but 50 titles means a very, very select um, lineup. And maybe you can talk about uh, a few of the titles and maybe what you think it means in terms of their approach or or how this festival might look like? Well, the big thing is uh, this partnership with the uh, Shift 72. This company sort of like was in the woodworks for a little while. And obviously with the COVID um, situation, the film festivals have reached out to this company. And essentially what they do is they do, uh, they, they set up virtual screening halls. Uh, what that will look like, we'll probably find out with Fantasia. Um, the big thing for me personally is that it doesn't look like there will be a need for me to actually go to Toronto. Now, I live in Canada, so that means it's just a, a car drive away. Um, but a lot of the screeners or screenings uh, will take place virtually uh, for press and industry. So. That's going to be uh, an interesting um, thing in itself. Um, TIFF um, announced eight titles of the eight, four are actually world premieres and have not been mentioned at any other film festival. Um, we can go through the, the world premieres. Um, a lot of, um, um, I'll call it black films, meaning um, African Americans or um, uh, either filmmakers or actors. Um, so um, we have uh, Hale Berry, who uh, is bringing her directorial debut. Uh, I don't know if we um, if folks remember this, but she actually had injured herself um, while shooting. It's like an MMA fighter type thing, and it's called Bruise. That's part of the lineup. Um, there's Good Joe Bell. That's uh, Ronaldo Green. He did Monsters and Men. And he's also on board to do King Richard, which is sort of like it landed in some legal trouble this week um, because of some rights issues. Um, I sort of like, I, 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 when I read the synopsis for Good Joe Bell, it remind, it's akin to something that we might have seen in Straight Story, uh, the, the David Lynch film, where it's really a journey of one man who goes across America. For what reason? We'll find out. Um, Mark Wahlberg is toplining this um, this project. I believe it was with A24 uh, beforehand, so it maybe it might have shifted hands. We have another film with uh, another directorial debut. It's called Concrete Cowboy. Um, this is by a filmmaker named Ricky, Ricky Staub. Essentially, it takes place in Philly, and it's got uh, Idris uh, Elba, and stars uh, Jarrell Jerome, who uh, we saw in Moonlight, and also in a, he was part of an ensemble cast in uh, Sully and the Slades, which was, uh, which was at Sundance, I believe, two years back, and just came out on Amazon. A uh, recognizable face, um, so he sort of like, um, it's a, it's a father-son story, and takes place in Philly with horses, so there's some horse back there. Finally, um, they've programmed somebody that's been at the festival before. Um, he's more a wavelength type filmmaker. He's, it's very slow cinema at the, in the, cin uh, uh, the cinema that we know from uh, Nicholas uh, Pareda. He's a Mexican Canadian filmmaker and he um, workshopped this film uh, called Fona at um, Los Cabos. And so it's been, it's been, um, in production for a little while so that's it's kind of cool like like there's 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 stuff for the crowds and then there's stuff that relates back to programs that might actually be dissolved this year because there probably won't be any needs for any programs um kevin perhaps you can then go into the four titles that were announced that can actually and now get announced here and i'll probably see their first public screening sure um so as you mentioned earlier, um, 
uh, those are the Cannes selections. And these films that I'm about to talk about are being counted as world uh, premieres um, in Toronto. I believe that's how they'll be uh, presented. Um, so we have the easily the most uh, buzzed about movie of this year, um, at least among cinephiles I mean, outside of Tenet, I guess, mm -hmm. um, is Ammonite, uh, Francis Lee's um, romantic drama with uh, Kate Winslet and uh, Saoirse Ronan. Uh, so that's a huge, that's a huge title. Um, easily uh, an award season favorite. Um, we have um, Thomas Winter Winterberg's uh, Another Round um, with um, Mads Mikkelsen, which is again, a highly anticipated title. Um, one that should uh, generate certainly a lot of interest uh, from TIFF goers. Um, we for, that have, one, for that one, you, um, you had shown to me that's getting a domestic release in the fall mm. after TIFF. I thought it was a, a summer um, title for Denmark, but um, but yeah, that one's getting uh, probably a showing right after TIFF, so. Yeah. Um, we also have uh, Suzanne Lindon's uh, Spring Blossom, which again, uh, a selection by TIFF, I don't know, sorry, by Can from a, a debut filmmaker. She's the daughter of uh, the actor uh, Vincent Lindon, but um, mm -hmm. this is a real stamp of approval for this film. Uh, a great sort of launching, double launching pad really for the director. And we have uh, Naomi Kawasi's uh, True Mothers. Um, again, Can Stamp, TIFF Stamp, uh, and one, and really again, putting it on the map. Um, you, mentioned, you mentioned earlier uh, a couple things I just want to touch on. Uh, the categories, it'll be, you're right, it'll be interesting to see if, there, if this is just a list of 50 films. My guess is they might do maybe three categories, maybe four, maybe, maybe a slimmed down platform, maybe without a cash prize this year, uh, maybe a slimmed down wavelength, uh, because I think, and they'll wanna have some sort of Canadian focus as well, mm -hmm. even with 50 titles. Um, so I think they will do categories. Uh, I don't think the categories will be very big. I mean, we're talking eight films they've announced already. That's almost, you know, you know um, uh, 20% of the lineup. Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, more to discover, but I mean, we're already, we're already well into it. Uh, and you bring up a good point about Spring 72, the screening platform they'll be using. Um, what's interesting to me is, is one of the things that happens at Cannes and at TIFF is, you know, critics and, and audience goers, they see a film and then immediately after they're, they're tweeting out their first reaction. I'm very curious if we are going to see, um, some critics uh, whipping out their phones during these virtual screenings and maybe live tweeting or whatnot, or what sort of protocols there will be in place um, from publicists or sales companies to say, hey, you know, at least keep your reaction until the film's over. So I think that'll, this is a really big experiment, not just in terms of technology, but in terms of how this films will be even discussed um, this fall. Well put. Um, and uh, just to wrap up on TIFF, I think they might have the platform category, which is their competition section thing. I think they might still try to um, keep that, put that together. And they will be showing five programs of short films. So um, okay. I don't think it's going to be part of their 50 or 60-ish um, total amount, if that's really the number. But, um, but that's still encouraging that... Uh, that short film filmmakers can still have a launching pad as well. And a second or third um, uh, uh, premiere, um, I believe that's, that's how it works for TIFF. Yeah. Um, moving along, we, we got news this week, a fairly big filmmaker um, and being joined by a top notch actor. Um, so, uh, so, as we know, Leonardo DiCaprio is very much in the a philanthrop, uh, he believes a lot into ph philanthropy, and uh, this is a project that sort of falls along uh, those uh, ideals or those those standards that he that he has. Um, he, as we know, he, he finances a lot of doc films or attaches himself in terms of uh, producer credits. Um, but this time it's for a feature adaptation of 
a popular Netflix title, and this too will be in a Netflix title, I believe. So, um, yeah, who's the big filmmaker that's uh, that's writing the project? So uh, Barry Jenkins of Moonlight and uh, Phil Street Could Talk fame is writing the script for the feature adaptation of uh, Virunga, uh, hugely celebrated documentary. Um, uh, one that was a big, a big uh, conversation starter for Netflix. It was a big title for them. Mm -hmm. um, and this is huge news. You're right, Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, he spends as much time, if not more, producing projects and getting involved with en environmental concerns as he does starring in, in films. Uh, and so he's putting his weight behind this as a producer. Uh, and it's really two huge talents to, to talk about this issue of um, of gorillas uh, that are endangered being protected. Uh, that it's, it's still timely, it's still dramatic, it's still very important. Um, so yeah, this is a really, really interesting development. I'm thinking it might be a difficult task for, for Barry Jenkins. Um, as far as just strictly writing credits, he's done um, uh, Charm City Kings, which I believe was also a doc film that was made into a Sundance film, which was picked up by Sony Pictures Classics. And that was showcased at Sundance. I wasn't a fan of this film. It was story by, he didn't technically write the screenplay. But um, he also wrote the screenplay for Rachel Morrison's Flint Strong, which is uh, like a boxing story, uh, drama, uh, which was about to get, uh, get um, go into production in Toronto. I think they were three days in and that was canceled. But um, it's interesting that Barry, who already has a lot on the plate, um, is able to sort of like, um, uh, take on projects like this. Now this one I think might be a bit more difficult um, unless you're focusing on one main protagonist. Um, if we remember the, the doc film, it, there's a lot of people in it that are featured in the doc film and there's a lot of force of nature elements. And so there's like this cataclysm that exists. And, um, and so I'm trying to think ahead. I'm like, oh God, this does feel like a, a weighty subject matter, but, um, but yeah, you might have to slim it down and, and, and concentrate on, I, won't, I don't want to call him a hero, but like an anti-hero or, or, or some saving, um, saving grace for, the, for, the, for nature. Perhaps, but uh, yeah, I think we also need to remember Barry Jenkins has made two features now that sort of push the edges of traditional narrative. So mm -hmm. I'm sure he will find a very interesting way into the material and and put his spin on it. You know, you can never control what happens to a script once it leaves your hands and is directed by someone else. But, you know, he's a guy that's certainly, um, he, he, his influences are, are art house. Um, and he's, he's certainly never shown an interest for, for walking a, a traditional path. So, uh, I think it'll be interesting to see how he takes the story and where and where he decides to um, how he decides to frame it and present it. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly, uh, what's certain is that we'll have a black protagonist uh, once again, and uh, uh, it's just nice to see that uh, uh, his trajectory and his filmography as of late. It's just it's nice to see him uh, um, on both sides, if you will, uh, writing and directing and producing as well. Um, the next project that I want to bring up, um, there's a little bit more research, a little bit of more digging to, to figure out what are the, who are these people, what's this project about. Uh, the first name that, that, that we saw in the headline is uh, Claire Foy. Um, so she's joined a project called Dust, um, which is a psychological horror film. And um, it's based uh, on a, on a, um, a short film collaboration. So, yeah, I was watching Hereditary uh, the other day and I was thinking, when I read this headline, I'm like, oh, this is a potential great vehicle. Um, she might add herself to the Scream, uh, Scream Queen set. Um, so I'm not really familiar with the actress in terms of what she's done with The Crown, but um, uh, on your end, uh, is there any significant films that, uh, that or performances for you where uh, 
where she uh, sort of like is a, a cut above? Uh, well, firstly, I, I'm a big fan of The Crown. <laughs> so she was oh, great. great. She was actually great in that. But for me, so just so just to give a quick recap of the plot here, um, this is a film that will find uh, Claire Foy playing a young mother in the 30s in Oklahoma who becomes sort of increasingly um, stifled and trapped by these uh, dust storms, which are sort of frequent in the area, and then takes ex extreme measures to protect her family. Um, the thing that, that hops out to my mind, actually, reading that synopsis and, and thinking about the actress is um, Steven Soderbergh's Unsane, um, which is, you know, the variety says this film, Dust, will be sort of a minimalist aesthetic. And while Insane isn't exactly minimalist, it's a very contained film that's entirely driven by her performance. And I think this is another opportunity or, or another sort of situation where um, the story of this mother who's sort of increasingly, um, I guess, going mad uh, will be driving um, this tale as well. So I think Claire Foy is great. I think she's a great actress. Um, uh who whose range has probably not been fully explored yet i mean she was um elizabeth salander in the not so great um spider's web reboot but she was very good um i think she was kind of not used very well in first man but mm -hmm. um yeah i i think it's it's very very interesting i think the other interesting element here is the producer and maybe you can speak to that a little bit so the producing tandem, um, we have somebody who's been in the business for about a decade plus, and Alex uh, Madigan. Um, she's done, uh, her, her most notable film is uh, Winner's Bone, uh, Deborah Granick's film. Um, she also did a great Iraqi film. She, she's very choosy about the items that she tackles. Um, uh, some of her more recent fare, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if you haven't heard of the titles before. Uh, Lucas uh, Joaquin, um, again, ma I'm mentioning Sella and the Slade, um, but he also did the Evening Hour, which was at Sundance this year, and he has participated on at least three Ira Sachs films on some producing capacity. Um, so it's an exciting producing team. Um, and in terms of the filmmakers, so this is a project that was at the Sundance labs um, specifically there was a 2014 stint at the screenwriters lab the same year that uh, Anna Lily uh, Amarpour was there with the Bad Batch um, and uh, so it's Carrie Krause and Will uh, join us and they worked on the the short and uh, she actually co-wrote uh, Martha Stiffen's, uh, Stiffen's uh, first film, um, Pilgrim Song. So they've been working on this project for a while. I imagine it took a while to put the pieces together. But once you find that actress who's willing to go to, to bat um, for a project, um, and especially a genre project like this, then I think all the elements then fall into place. So... I can imagine this being something that we might find at Sundance if it goes into production fairly soon. But then again, is Sundance going to happen next year? We don't know. But um, it's something that, as you were saying, that it, it feels isolated. I was thinking of Take Shelter a little bit. Um, so apparently it's going to be a little bit easier in terms of filming the filming conditions for this. If, you're, if you're, you've got a very small character set, then... Um, yeah, you can go about it safely and soundly, and um, yeah, maybe it'll take place in Oklahoma as as the, the screenplay it's based on. For me, I, I, I was looking at this project, and I was thinking back to Julianne Moore and the different eras that we've sort of like, you know, there's the 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 early 90s where she really broke out in a lot of roles, and then the knots, and then, you know, the last decade. Um, is it fair to sort of like compare decades and say, despite the fact that she got Oscar in the last 10 years, that her, her, her better work is the, maybe the previous decade before? I don't think it's fair necessarily. I, I think, I mean, if you look at say the past five years, I mean, she's still working with like, you know, she worked with Rebecca Miller on Maggie's Plan, which I really enjoyed, but didn't really, uh, she worked with Todd, Todd Haynes on Wonderstruck. 
George Clooney on Suburbicon. Uh, you know, she, it's not like, it's not for lack of working with auteurs. I think it's just unfortunate that, you know, she just hit, I think she just hit like an unfortunate run of films that just didn't break out the way maybe people thought they would. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, she also did uh, Gloria Bell with Sebastian Mel Lilio. So she still works, she's still finding great directors to work with. Um, and she's always, no matter the picture, she's always exciting to watch. She's a great actress. Mm -hmm. So, so perhaps, uh, A24 made that link because they were doing promotion for Gloria Bell. So they probably said, you know what, maybe we want this person on board. Um, but yeah, let's look out for Sharper. There's going to be more development, probably a filmmaker attached in the, and uh, fairly soon. Mm -hmm. um, moving on to another project uh, that we've sort of like assessed early on. Um, at the time, it was only uh, we had a uh, the producers on board, we had the filmmaker and the, the the title and a little bit of the backstory. But now we got major casting news. So uh, uh, Eva Hussan uh, signed up a quartet, uh, some notable figures in that. Uh, for Mother Sunday, which is their third feature after uh, Bang Gang and uh, the title that went to Cannes, I don't recall the name of it. Um, but uh, yeah, perhaps we can dig deeper into the actors and actresses that are on board. So yeah, this is a big leap um, for, for Ipo Hussan, who's um, been a Cannes favorite. Uh, so far um, and sort of been on the art house circuit but this should put her onto sort of a, a bigger plane I mean she's got um, Josh O'Connor, Olivia Coleman, um, Odessa Young and, and the biggest oh. of all of them well besides Olivia Coleman is uh, Colin Firth um, for uh, for the picture um, Mothering Sunday which is going to be quite different from her two films to date. Uh, this is a period piece uh, set in 1924 based on a novel by Graham Greene. There's a bit of like a romantic entanglement to it, a bit of like um, family complication element. So it's a really big uh, step in a new direction, I feel, um, for this filmmaker. Um, for myself personally, I, I only know her films sort of peripherally. I haven't, I haven't watched them. Uh, but maybe you can speak to to her films and maybe where you see her skill set in this particular story. So uh, 2015's uh, Bang Gang and Modern Love Story, that I believe was a TIFF premiere, um, mm -hmm. a contemporary film. Uh, 2018's uh, Girls of the Sun was a competition film. Um, I think um, it was one of the my least favorite titles of that, um, of that comp here. Um, I can, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I just felt that there's a lot of manipulation and, and it's a character that we've seen sort of like patched, uh, um, it's like a freedom fighter and sort of like gets stuck in the crosshairs of a, uh, I believe it's a civil war in, I forget which country. Mm -hmm. um, That's a fatigue speaking right now. Um, but, um, yeah, I have a lot more faith or, or, um, I think there's going to be a lot more going for this project. Um, and I'm, I'm putting a lot of the weight of this project, not on Coleman, who I figured that we're just going to get a great performance from her. Um, but this, uh, this starlet named Odessa Young, she was in a film called Assassination Nation, which was a TIFF, uh, sorry, a Sundance, uh, premiere a couple of years back. But she was also in uh, Josephine uh, Decker's um, Shirley, which is a film that, again, came out at Sundance this year and was just recently released on Hulu, Amazon. And I think she was fantastic, um, able to take um, a, a character um, far beyond the, uh, the learning the ropes type uh, mentality of a young uh, woman who is um, in... Um, and disaccord with with um, her future path, and has all these different influences, including um, uh, Logan Lerman, who's there, and um, 
and uh, Elizabeth Moss. So there's like, it was just a, a great film. And for me, it was a standout moment for this actress. So I have a feeling she's going to be top lining this as the character of Jane Fairchild. And um, yeah, I think there's a lot going for this. And again, this is another project that's very COVID friendly. It's a smaller uh, character set and they're going to probably be in a, um, not too many backdrops and um, yeah, it makes it a lot easier to deal, to, to go into production in, in 2020. And we probably should mention, which we haven't yet, is that this would be her English language debut. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so that's another big um, step up. And, you know, the talent um, below the line is, is quite impressive. She has Sandy Powell doing the costumes, uh, which is a huge, huge thing as well. I mean, um, she's an Oscar winner, worked with Scorsese and, and countless other great directors. So this one's coming with a lot of talent attached, which, um, Sets expectations high, certainly. Great. So, in a in a normal normal 2021, uh, this it'll this might appear at a major film festival such as a Return to Can. Um, that's it for this project. And in Bill Murray news, um, this week it was announced that he would be a voice talent for a project with a fairly good actress and um, one of our better producers out there. Um, Kevin, what's the name of the film? Who are these actors? And yeah, what, 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 what are we to expect with this project? So this film, I'm going to go on record, I think Anne Hathaway is a really great actress. Uh, so it's Anne Hathaway, uh, Bill Murray, and uh, Robert Duvall in Bum's Rush, which is, uh, in three words, four, sorry, four words, a talking dog movie. Uh, it's about uh, the relationship between a woman and a stray dog and how their lives were changed when their lives cross paths. I feel like we get about five of these dog movies a year. Uh, I never see any of them. <laughs> And I frankly am, it, my mind's boggled about why, why these actors are going to do this. And, and, you know, for Bill Murray, he's worked with uh, director Aaron Schneider before on Get Low uh, quite a few years ago. Uh, and Aaron Schneider directed um, the upcoming World War II movie, uh, Greyhound, uh, that's coming out on Apple with Tom Hanks. But I still, like, I really don't get it. And the biggest question mark for me is producer Sarah Green, and maybe you can get into that a little bit about what her credits are like and why it's a little bit disconnected uh, from this talking dog movie. So she's done some Jeff Nichols film and some Terrence Malick film and has partnered with Brad Pitt. And so I mentioned she's very choosy about her material. We don't see her name pop up just, about, just on anything. Um, production will take place in Santa Barbara, California, and New Mexico. So regionally, it's it's more or less in an area she's familiar with, just like west of Texas, obviously, um, and Ar Arkansas, I guess. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a weird crosshair or or amalgamation of uh, of uh, talent and. Um, and that's the other thing is this this filmmaker Aaron Schneider is coming off a huge, a huge film, like like hundreds of million, I think a hundred million at least um, spent on this Tom Hanks film. So yeah, it's just, it's a weird concoction. Um, Maybe they all just really like dogs. I mean, I get it, I like dogs, so why not? But this ain't a Wes Anderson film and um, yeah, like you said, there's a lot of stuff in the cans market with dogs and posters and basketballs and whatnot, so. I mean, he has done Garfield, so maybe he wants to complete the Pet Lovers. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I guess we'll see what this is. Maybe, it'll, maybe this will be the most artfully directed Terrence Malick-like talking dog movie we've ever seen. Well, Aaron Schneider won the best first feature for um, at the Indie Spirits Awards. And so 
that is some clout and so um yeah major acting talent um voice talent and a major producer on board a project that will probably lens uh, fairly soon and we'll be seeing in 2021 Hi, I'm Eric Lavallee. I'm Editor-in-Chief and Site Owner for IonCinema.com, and this is Kevin Jaggernaut, Contributing Writer for The Playlist. And together we are Indie Sponge.